Somebody will be talking about trustworthy AI, um, whose trust needs to be earned and how. So a couple of disclosures up here. Uh, probably the most important thing to say is that these are my views and not the views of UCSF or UC Berkeley. Um, so some take home points. Trust is earned from a person or a community. It's a, a human thing to trust something. And then the thing that is trusted has to be worthy of that trust. So I think those are really important concepts to have in mind, what trust is. It's a human thing that we trust a, 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 you know, some object, and that object has to be worthy of our trust. Um, and uh, the bottom line, I think, is trustworthiness is best achieved by a continuing demonstration of robustness and reliability. I'm actually going to say that transparency and explainability and all that isn't all, maybe all that important. Um, maybe a little different from what you might otherwise hear. And that AI vigilance is where we need to, where, where we need to be vigilant. So um, many of you probably have some notion of what AI and, and ML and large language models are, but I just want to do a quick overview just so we're all on the same page uh, and then dive right in. So. Artificial intelligence, you've probably heard lots and lots of definitions. They're all right, they're all wrong. Um, it's the ability of a machine to perform tasks and behave like an intelligent being, okay? Whether it really is intelligent or not is a philosophical question, we're not gonna get there, but it behaves like an intelligent being, okay? Um, and there are many ways that it, that it gets there, so just keep that in mind. Uh, machine learning is a subtype of AI. Um, AI is a lot more than machine learning. AI is planning. AI is, uh, you, you know, human uh, supporting human user inter interaction. It is reasoning. Uh, there's a lot more to it. But machine learning is sort of how we reductively think about AI before you know large language models came around. And the way that I would suggest you think about machine learning is computer algorithms that have find and apply data in huge amounts of uh, find patterns in huge amounts of data. And you might think, well, wait, I took a statistics class, and, and I th isn't that what statistics does? Yes, it is. In fact, it turns out, I would say, that you know, if you're in a statistics department, you might call it method statistics, and if you were a computer science department, you would call it machine learning. In some ways, it's the same thing. A bunch of data goes in, you crank some you know, algorithm, and out comes some conclusion. And so whenever you hear about trustworthy machine learning, or transparency or explainability of machine learning, just substitute the word statistics. Do we have trustworthy statistics? Do we have explainable statistics? Uh, we don't. We weren't so concerned about it. We should have been, I think. Um, but but really, machine learning statistics. You can think of them sort of in in the sort of you know uh, algorithmic transformations of data that give us some kind of answer. Okay. Now, uh, November of 2020. Two brought us uh, large language models and chat GPT and so forth. And that really is a very different kind of AI compared to the uh, sort of the machine learning uh, sort of predictive analytics that we have. And it is called generative AI because it generates, and some of you may have heard large language models described as hallucinating stochastic parrots. Uh, so why is it a parrot? Because it's a parrot that has heard a lot of words, like all the words on the internet. Right, that's what it is, it's just, and it parrots it back, like literally parrots it back based on the patterns that it's seen in all our utterings, you know, on the, on the web, right? Stochastic, fancy word for probabilistic, the parrot parrots the next word with a random probability based on patterns that it's seen before. One word after another after another based on patterns before adds up to a sentence. And the sentence may or may not be true. So we call it hallucinating. It's, you know, there are different words for it. But um, so it ends up as if it knows something, but it's just a hallucinating stochastic parrot. Okay? <laughs> and they're different, just like there are different species of parrots, right? There's, there's all the different species of, of large language models. You're aware of GPT-4, that's OpenAI, Gemini from Google, Llama 2 from Meta. Um, putting this up here, not because I endorse any of them, but you know, that's to track them that these models come from these very, very large tech companies. Some of them are proprietary, uh, Gemini, uh, GPT-4 is, uh, uh, Llama 2, for example, is, is open source, okay? But they're all of this type of model, large language models that are generative AI, which is different from sort of other types of neural network, uh, deep learning models that are machine learning, okay? 
So that's sort of the background, keep that in mind. Um, trust and trustworthiness, as I said, trust is a firm belief in the reliability, truthability, or strength of someone or something. So it's humans and it's communities who do the trusting. And the trustworthiness in this case of AI is the ability to be relied on as honest or truthful, okay? And so if we think about it, we have patients, clinicians, and public who trust a hallucinating stochastic parrot um, and other forms of AI. And the, the parrot and the non-LLM AI have to have an, uh, the, the characteristic of trustworthiness that earns trust from patients, clinicians, and public. And of course, each of those groups have different different requirements for what they would trust, right? So it's, it's a relationship. I think it doesn't make sense to say, oh, this program is trusted. That, that makes no sense to me. It has to be trustworthy for a particular audience um, in, in the way that that makes sense for that audience. Here are the uh, uh, Health and Human Services principles of trustworthy AI. There are many, many of these principles out there. They're all really about the same. Um, but I'm going to focus on uh, transparency, uh, explainability, and interpretability, and then we're going to focus on uh, robust and reliable. And all of these principles are in balance with each other, and there are always trade-offs, but let's dive a little bit deeper. So first of all, algorithmic transparency. Is that sufficient? Does transparency lead in and of itself to trustworthiness? I would say no. I think it's very useful, but it is not at all sufficient. What we do need is a transparency. If we go back, and you know, you can't read the uh, the, the actual uh, you know text in there, but I, I've replicated here. All relevant individuals should understand how their data is being used. Uh, we had a discussion with the students earlier. That point came up. Absolutely, we need transparency, but that's transparency around the policy of data and data sharing and data use. It's not transparency about the algorithm itself. So I think we would need to be really careful when we say transparency, what do we need transparency on, okay? So yes, I think regardless of AI, we need a transparency on data sharing. We're not really there yet, totally agree. It's not really, it's, it's not an AI specific uh, question. All relevant individuals should understand how AI systems make decisions. I agree with that one, but rem look carefully, it's AI systems and I think the AI system is not just the algorithm itself, it's how the algorithm is implemented, situated within a human context. So it's the organ, it's the, it's the hospital that makes the decisions for which the algorithm is a tool. It's the clinician who makes a decision for whom uh, the algorithm is a tool. The algorithm itself rarely makes decisions on its own. It's rare actually to have an algorithm totally be a closed loop. And if it does, it might be something like it adjusts your ventilator settings, right? That kind of thing. There you can say, okay, the algorithm is making a decision. Um, and maybe we need transparency around that. But I, I think when we're talking about, about transparency and public trust, it's really around uh, the whole system which makes a decision for which the algorithm I think is just a, a, a component. It's an important component, but it's not the only component. So I think the transparency of the algorithm itself is needed, as we'll go in later, for robust and reliable AI, but does not by itself lead to trustworthiness. So I think having, um, I'm thinking this one through, but I, if, we, if we wrote a policy that said algorithms need to be transparent to earn public trust, I kind of say, well, I don't know how much money we should put into that to enforce that and require that, because that I don't think is really the, the, the most important thing. How about inspectability? Algorithms, attributes, and correlations should be open to inspection. So to me, it's kind of like, well, do we need to dissect the parrot? Uh, do we need to look at the entrails? Uh, and if we looked at the entrails, like what are we trying to interpret from it. Um, these models, the large language models, are like, um, I think GPT-4 is 1.7 trillion parameters. It's not inspectable, like you can't open it up and expect to see something that we can interpret. It's just not how it works. And in fact, we don't know how these things work. At the UCSF School of Medicine, we had uh, recently had Stuart Russell, Professor Stuart Russell from Berkeley, uh, you know, literally wrote the textbook in AI. We also had Peter Lee, who's the head of Microsoft Research. And, uh, you know, we have, we actually do not know how these large language models work. We just don't. Getting better insights, uh, Peter Lee said, but we still don't. So if we have inspectable 
algorithms, and we can look under the hood and look at the 1.7 trillion parameters and how the weights are and whatever, what does that tell us? Like, it, does, that, does that make us trust the thing more? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that, that it does. Um, and of course, we don't ask for inspectability of statistical models. We've never done that. You know, show me the weights on your logistic regression that tells me that your insurance uh, claim is rejected. We should have been asking that, but we didn't before, and now we think we do. Let's just be really careful about why we need it. I think we do need inspectability, again, so we can do robust and reliable AI, but again, does not by itself lead to trustworthiness, and if we made it inspectable for the public, I, I, I'm not sure that that really, that really helps. So again, just trying to say, is it where we want to put our policy eggs? Is that where we want to you know, uh, put our resources or, or not? Explainability. Now, this one seems really obvious. We should be able to understand what a model is doing and what it suggests, right? Uh, but it's actually not a reasonable expectation of generative AI of the large language models, chat GPT, because these things are inherently stochastic. They're inherently probabilistic. And it really is just one sentence after another. And if you think about it conceptually, it's one sentence after another. How in the heck can it really be explaining something about the world? So we want it to explain. We want a story, but it, it can confabulate a story for us. Uh, but it may not be right. Um, and as I said, there are different kinds of AI. There are different uh, representational technologies in AI, like belief networks or knowledge graphs, that do explicitly reason and can give you an answer, it's the wrong thing to ask of generative AI. So I, I think, again, understanding the technology allows you to ask the right kinds of questions to it. Now, the other point I want to make is that just because something is explainable doesn't mean that the explanation is correct, right? You may remember back in your you know, early studies, the Ptolemaic model, the sun revolves around the Earth, right? And that was a model that actually, um, I did a little bit of looking up in it, uh, the model is actually highly predictive and explanatory for the observed motion of the celestial bodies, right? The Ptolemaic model will tell you where Venus is next morning, and it'll tell you it's because there are, there are 36 epicycles of all the celestial bodies that like, you know, epicycle around each other, okay? Of course, then the Copernica model came around where the Earth revolves around the sun. And it was also very predictive of where Venus is in the morning, but it's a radically different explanation for what the universe is, where the Earth revolves around the sun, okay? So if you're looking for a prediction of the position of Venus, both of these models were predictively accurate. They were both explanatory, but only one of them was the explanation real? And only one of them would you use to send a spacecraft to Mars, right? So algorithmic explainability does not by itself lead to trustworthiness. I worry that people can come up with a story that sounds real, and then you trust it, whereas you really shouldn't. And the, then the analogy there would be um, the stock market, where somebody tells you why the stock market went up and down. And it sounds incredibly plausible. It's probably not true. And if you do your investment based on stories that sound true, you know, uh, you know, caution, right? So explainability, I think, is a really, really tricky one. And we have to be really careful that we don't rely on it too much uh, for trustworthiness. So that brings us to robust and reliable, which I think is really what's the most important. Um, and maybe that the one take home is to understand that software is fundamentally different for in, in the medical setting from a drug, okay? A drug is a fixed molecular entity. The FDA approves it. It stays the same. It just stays the same. We do monitor for side effects and, 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 and so forth, but, you know, our bodies physically are basically, you know, the same. Um, over the years, you know, our biology doesn't change that much, and then the fixed molecular entity doesn't change that much. But software changes. Uh, we get updates, right, on our, on our, on our devices. Um, the performance drifts over time. There's concept drift, so long COVID. Hopefully, we'll have a better understanding of long COVID in the years to come. But what's coded as long COVID today is going to drift over time. And so the algorithms that work on long COVID are going, their performance is going to change. The way that our variables change, um, the presentation of COVID is now different. So COVID is a very different disease than it was four years ago. So algorithms trained four years ago are not going to be 
accurate. Or the way that we practice medicine, my incentives may have changed. The guidelines that I'm supposed to follow are changed. So now, if my practice pattern has changed, the algorithm is now out of whack with how I practice. Or in other cases, it might be the algorithm that works really well, and I'm actually changing my practice because of the algorithm. And now, because I practice differently, the algorithm has now gone out of whack with how I practice because the algorithm actually changed the way I practice, right? So we need to be very vigilant about the performance of AI over time, and it's something we can't stop. We can't say, you know, we've monitored it for a year, we're done. It's an ongoing vigilance. That's not how we're set up in the health system, and there are a tremendous number of different methods that we need to do to, uh, to monitor that. So uh, this is how I think about uh, continuing demonstration of robustness and reliability. We are doing this uh, at, uh, at UCSF, where uh, on the top, we have what's being evaluated, which is the algorithm. We start off with monitoring the performance of the algorithm in a retrospective way. So we just run it on data and see what happens. And then we let it into the wild, you know, into the healthcare system. We do a pilot deployment where we prove that it has some clinical value, right? So we're tracking the data and the algorithm. We're looking for the drift, as we talked about before. We're also looking for patient outcomes. And we should also look for patient trust we should look at how it's impacting the physician or, or the clinician. We should look at efficiency metrics, return on investment at the health system level. Uh, and I've recently added society, fairness, bias, and justice. So um, it came up in a, in a recent uh, uh, meeting. It's like, well, isn't anything that helps a patient, like, isn't, isn't that inherently good? It's like, no. What if there was a system that was really good for the wealthy uh, uh, patient? for concierge physicians only, and that health system, which is a for-profit health system, is very profitable, but in the end, it just doesn't help anybody else in society, right? So we can actually be really good for the patient, the clinician, the health system, and exacerbate biases in society, and is that good or not? And obviously our, our system, our, our capitalist system is sort of set up to do that, but AI can exacerbate all of that. So we do need to think, I think, about societal impacts of, of AI and the way it's constructed and the way that it's run. So uh, this picture um, you know, reflects a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done in the health system, both uh, locally within uh, you know, one medical center like ECSF, but also across uh, you know, health systems uh, collectively across the nation. Uh, there are talks at the federal level about a centralized um, evaluation, like a, a national AI assurance lab, for example, uh, and a lots, of, lots of different methods that we need to, uh, to carry out the demonstration of robustness and reliability, which I think is really the fundamental thing that we need, ongoing demonstration of robustness and reliability. We need the transparency, interpretability, and explainability to allow us to do that kind of demonstration, but that I think is the fundamental thing that we need to build into our systems on an ongoing basis, that AI vigilance, that's gonna what uh, I think is gonna earn us the trust of our patients, our clinicians, and our public. Uh, and uh, there's no time to lose to do that. So uh, thanks to a, a number of leaders at UCSF and, and many, many others, of course, and um, I will stop there. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you to Dr. Kravitz and the rest of the team here at UC Center Sacramento for having me. Uh, I am delighted to be able to follow uh, Ida here and talk about uh, AI governance at University of California Health. And I'll spend some time talking about um, what that is, um, why it's needed, um, and uh, some efforts at the state and national level, and then also spend some time um, talking about um, some some ways of operationalizing it. Uh, and so let me start here. Uh, AI in healthcare is not new, and I think this was a point uh, that Ida made. So um, even before generative AI, um, for a number of years, um, there has been talk about the promise of AI in healthcare to, uh, to improve um, patient outcomes, to increase efficiency, and to expand coverage. And there have definitely been um, a lot of uh, use cases um, and also uh, models that um, have proven not to be um, uh, measured, to provide a measured benefit to patients and clinicians. 
So here on the slide here, we have a couple of uh, the common use cases for um, machine learning and natural language processing um, in the healthcare setting. So first, improving hospital administration. This has uh, long been um, an area of study for um, hospitals and implementation in terms of improving patient scheduling, um, flow through the hospital, uh, and also um, reducing uh, um, and making the administrative burden um, that affects clinicians um, lighter. Second, clinical decision support. Um, researchers have uh, done a lot of work into um, precision medicine, the tailoring and the using of AI to tailor uh, um, treatments to particular patients, as well as the ability of AI to help diagnose um, uh, particular uh, diseases um, in a way that might um, be able to aid uh, clinicians. Um, there has been a lot of research particular in the areas of pathology and radiology. Population health management is another uh, area of, of AI um, focus um, in terms of helping with automated screening and then also population risk uh, stratification um, and patient self-management tools. So those are all areas where there have been, um, there has been some work. And then finally, of course, um, patient uh, payment and billing management um, is, a, is another area. Okay, but then as the story goes, uh, generative AI came along. And I think what we have seen since is a tremendous uh, uh, interest um, and acceleration of um, interest in deploying AI um, across uh, the healthcare delivery system. And so here we have um, just uh, one example. This is a study that came out from UCSD last year, and it compared responses to uh, real-world health questions from patients, um, from ChatGPT, chat uh, and then also from clinicians. And, uh, and so a uh, sort of a, a set of uh, clinicians reviewed the responses um, and found that ChatGPT's responses were, um, were overall um, ranked um, more highly, both in terms of quality and um, empathy. And so I'll say a couple things here about, about this study. First, the researchers made sure to keep um, humans uh, in the loop. So, so messages, um, first of all, patients were notified that there, there was this going on. Um, and secondly, uh, um, nothing was ever sent to a patient without being reviewed by a clinician first. So for me, the takeaway here is not that, um, that your, your doctors will be um, replaced by ChatGBT, but instead that there is, I think, very real um, potential for ChatGBT and other uh, generative AI models to potentially um, reduce uh, um, some of the administrative burden and um, increase um, uh, the ability of um, providers to provide care with less burnout. Um, and that is, uh, I think, one of the more pressing questions, I think, facing um, healthcare systems uh, today. So there is the promise of, of AI. So I tend to be uh, an AI optimist, and I think that not everyone is. Um, and like Ida, I will put aside sort of the large philosophical questions of um, in the future, uh, it, it, you know, is, is AI going to, um, you know, going to become uh, um, sort of sentient. But instead, I'll look at what some of the more practical risks are when it comes to AI. So why do we care about doing AI governance? It is because in order to really um, benefit from the potential of what these tools are, I think it requires a very honest um, and, and a clear-eyed assessment of what the risks are and what are the ways of mitigating those risks. Um, and so here on the slide, you'll have um, some of the, uh, the more commonly accepted risks. And this tracks exactly with uh, the HHS slide that Ida showed in her presentation. These are, I think, really uh, where a lot of the risks are um, in terms of convergence of, of dividing them into categories. Um, this list here actually comes from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIS, um, uh, AI um, Risk Management Framework, um, which is a uh, resource that I think 
um, many of these frameworks have kind of called back to. So not only uh, you know some of the ones I'll talk about coming up, um, but also, as Ida has mentioned, there have been a lot of frameworks um, that have come out. Um, and they are all kind of converging on the same um, set of risks. So, so later on in this talk, I'll talk a little bit about, OK, so how do we kind of dive deeper and really get to difficult questions about um, how to mitigate some of these risks? So I won't dwell on these here um, because I know that, that Ida spoke um, about several of them, as well as about kind of what are some of the um, drawbacks of, of um, how to um, define them. Because I think that is one of the important things. At a high level, you, it's easy to say transparency. But when you dive down, it's really important to think about like, what do we really mean? Like, What is important to um, the people who will be impacted by these tools? And that is, I think, where a lot of work will, um, will, will be done. Um, I will say that um, I added an eighth one here, and that is workforce and labor impacts. Um, and that uh, I added that because I think that that will be one of the pressing questions as well as, uh, as AI tools are increasingly developed and deployed um, throughout um, all, of, all of society. And so, um, so in addition to the, um, the common set of risks, I think those, that is a risk worth thinking about too. It will change workflows. It may require um, additional training. But it will also present uh, new tools. And so, uh, and so for this audience, um, this will be kind of, I think, part of our lives, I think, going forward. OK, so then I think here is uh, one of my big takeaways. And I think this is now something that is generally accepted. Guardrails are essential. Uh, essential for actually being able to develop and deploy these tools effectively. Um, and so on a practical level, I think here is what you get when you have strong AI governance. Here is, here, here is what we want to achieve. So I think um, it builds trust. Being trustworthy, as, as Ida um, uh, demonstrated, um, means that users will actually um, be able to deploy these tools and feel comfortable having them deployed with them in the environments in which they exist. It enables organizations to vet and authorize AI tools more quickly and in a transparent, replicable manner. Um, and so here, I think this is very, very hard to do, but this is an end state where we want to be, where we want to be in a place where an organization is able to take tools that are presented to it or tools that are developed there and deploy them and have those around them and those who are impacted understand how it's going to impact them, that it will impact them the same if that situation were to come up again, and how they will be interacting with these tools. AI governance enables the reduction of risk from unexpected harm and also reputational uh, damage for an organization. So this is thinking about why an organization um, should do the work that's needed um, to have responsible AI governance. Of course, it ensures compliance with existing and involving laws. But I put that here on the slide because there, uh, this is a very quickly evolving space. And so there will be um, additional legislation. There will be additional regulations. Um, I'll talk a little bit at the end about sort of my own personal views and reading the tea leaves. But this is something um, important to keep abreast of. And so thinking through and doing the work of AI governance enables organizations to be able to then um, effectively um, consider um, what some of these proposals are, um, and then in the policy world, um, potentially influence them. And then overall, I'll say, it promotes a safe and ethical innovation um, ecosystem. Um, and I, I raise this because I think what we're seeing with a lot of frameworks is a recognition that, um, particularly with the advent of generative AI, that there will be um, an ecosystem of development. And so we really want to um, promote that, um, but do it in a safe and responsible way. OK, so it's a highly active space. Um, and I think you know, Ida said, and she's totally right, that uh, there are a lot of these frameworks. And many of them are, are kind of like converging on the same set of um, things that make a system trustworthy. Here are just on this slide a few of the organizations in, who are focusing on this in the healthcare space, um, including the National Academy of Medicine. Um, NIST, as I said, um, the Coalition for Health AI, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, the World Health Organization, uh, AMA, which is not reflected here on the slide, but they came out with a set of guidelines uh, um, fairly recently, 
and then two executive orders that both have impacts um, on the healthcare space. And I'll talk about um, both of those now. The first is from President Biden, and the second is uh, from Governor Newsom. Okay, so President Biden's executive order on AI. Uh, this was actually uh, uh, signed um, in the fall of last year, uh, in October, um, and it was entitled Safe, Secure, and Trustworthy Development and Use of Artificial Intelligence. It develops a policy framework to manage the risks of AI and directs agency action actually across, even outside of, of healthcare, um, uh, to strike a balance between um, ensuring AI's potential and then also mitigating risks. There are a couple of directives here um, for uh, HHS, um, and those are the ones I've, I've focused on here. So the first is to uh, establish an HHS AI task force charged with developing a strategic plan for responsible use of AI um, in the health sector. Uh, and this strategic plan um, uh, should be um, accomplished um, within the next year. The second is to develop an AI assurance policy. And this is really focused on ensuring the quality of AI-enabled technologies, including infrastructure needs for both pre-market assessment and post-market oversight of algorithmic uh, system performance against um, actual real-world data. Third, um, ensuring compliance with non-discrimination laws. And then also creating an AI safety program that's really focused on creating um, uh, a way to uh, capture um, clinical error that might result from AI that's deployed in healthcare settings. The EO also directed HHS uh, to prepare a strategy for regulating use of AI in drug development. And then finally, to promote innovation, um, had some recommendations for HHS in terms of issuing um, grants and awards. So I'll note here about the strategic plan um, that it incorporates the need to uh, um, include equity considerations, privacy and security considerations, but it also includes um, uh, provisions that would promote um, the deployment of AI. And I think this is what uh, several of the other frameworks um, have also done. So I'll turn here to Governor Newsom's executive order on AI, which uh, was also signed uh, in the fall last year. And this uh, executive order, I think I'll note two things. One, it really focuses on generative AI. And the second is that it notes California's um, place as a leader on these, on these issues. And so it's, I think, you know, in, in some ways a very exciting time to be in, in California. And as the press release um, for this EO stated, California has established itself as the world leader in Gen I innovation with 35 of the world's top 50 AI companies and a quarter of all AI patents, conference papers, and companies globally. So that executive order contains directives mostly to state agencies and departments aimed at studying and deploying Gen, I, Gen AI ethically and responsibly through the state government. And that includes, for example, a procurement um, blueprint um, for public sector procurement of AI tools, a risk analysis report, a report on the beneficial uses of generative AI, um, state uh, training um, for employees, uh, and also a partnership um, with Berkeley and Stanford to evaluate the impacts of Gen AI on California. Um, and there will be, I think, a conference um, put forth uh, in 2024 on that. Engagement with legislative partners and also periodic evaluation of the AI landscape. Okay, so with that, let me, let me start to get into what are uh, some of the building blocks of AI governance. And I think a good place to start is um, a document that I referenced before, which is the NIST AI Risk Management Framework. So that framework came out in version 1.0 um, last year. And it is, um, for those of you who know kind of um, NIST operations, it is an iterative thing. So their, their frameworks often have um, later versions as they um, are, are ongoing and, and iterate. It is a resource that is referenced, um, I think, in both of the executive orders um, and in many of the frameworks that, that have come out. And it is aimed at really incorporating the ability to, um, to include these trustworthy uh, characteristics um, into the development, use, and evaluation of AI systems as they are deployed. 
It is not focused on the healthcare sector. It is actually industry agnostic, um, but it is meant as a, uh, a tool and a structure for thinking about how to evaluate risk. The characteristics of trustworthy um, AI um, track uh, the risks, essentially, that um, both Ida and I have spoke about. Um, and so uh, the idea is that a trustworthy AI system would incorporate understanding these characteristics in the context in which the, the tool is being used. The core is composed of four functions, and you can see this here um, on the graphic, um, map, measure, manage, and then govern. Um, and then within those cores, there are categories and subcategories of, uh, of things that an organization can do as it works through this process. Again, the categories that are listed um, are actually not meant as a checklist, nor are they meant to be done in any particular steps. Um, however, uh, they are a way to kind of drive responsible use and a way of thinking through a set of considerations uh, that organizations should do as they are contemplating um, the deployment of AI. So because the NIST AI RMF uh, is uh, industry agnostic, I'm gonna take a deeper dive into healthcare AI governance um, because I think much work has been done on the frameworks for responsible AI. And I think, as I mentioned, we're seeing a lot of convergence there but there is less on the practical steps for how to operationalize those. And that, I think, is where we're really going to start to see some work. Um, it is ongoing, but it's really going to kind of pick up pace. So for example, what does it mean when you, when you talk about um, transparency? And what does it mean, and how do you measure um, uh, bias? Um, and do we all have accepted standards? Are we all in agreement for what that is? Um, and the answer to that is actually is actually no, right? And so how do we get to a place where if someone says, yes, we have evaluated this tool for fairness, everyone understands what that is and is in agreement that that is, um, in fact, a fair set of standards. And so that is, I think, where we're going to see a lot of, a lot of work come up. There are a number of groups um, that are diving into this um, work, um, and I note just one of them here, and that is the Coalition for Health AI, or CHI. So the Coalition for Health AI is a, is a, a collection of, um, of members from academic health systems, from industry groups, from patient groups, from nonprofits, um, and also others who have come together to develop um, guardrails for the deployment of responsible AI in healthcare. Um, the first work product uh, they put out was, uh, was called a Blueprint for Trustworthy AI. Um, and that was really a fairly high-level document setting forth kind of overarching um, principles uh, and a framework. Uh, and since over the past, I'd say, eight months, the group has uh, turned to developing consensus-based considerations and evaluation criteria for the trustworthy characteristics of AI analyzed across the AI lifecycle. So this is uh, on the screen just actually a, a draft of the CHI AI lifecycle, um, and there are other um, lifecycles that are out there. But the general gist I want to convey here is that it's important to think of the risks that are presented in AI across um, the lifecycle of the product, which includes from the very start defining what the purpose of utilizing an AI model is. Like, do we, um, what is the problem we are trying to solve? And is this model the best way of solving it? Um, what will we achieve um, by doing this? And then it moves into uh, developing the model, um, which includes a lot of engineering of the data. Um, and then here, I think a lot of organizations, you know, some may develop, but a lot may sort of uh, may purchase. And so it's a recognition that you can develop, but you can also um, you also might need to be purchasing that from a vendor. And then you reach the point of implementation. And in each of these stages, um, for each of the trustworthy characteristics, um, Chai is developing a set of considerations and an evaluation criteria that entities should ask themselves. And that will help them um, determine um, whether or not this, this tool makes sense for them to deploy. Uh, to take sort of one example of, um, of bias. So I think, um, and I think this is actually a point that I raised, bias can actually enter a model in several different stages. 
So, um, so for example, when you are thinking of the problem you are solving and you're thinking of a way to measure that, I think one of the concerns in the healthcare field has been that the proxy you are using it actually itself incorporates bias, and that can be a problem. In addition, I think the data that you are using to, uh, to train your model may not be inclusive of all of the data you would want for that model to be fair as it is applied. Um, and this is, uh, I think this came up actually in our conversation um, that I hadn't had with the students before, but there are places where our, there are data deserts and that can impact um, and does impact models. And so that is another place um, where, uh, where bias can come in. Um, and then as well, uh, the data can incorporate sort of human, um, human biases. And so that is another um, way uh, that um, uh, the bias can both enter and another way that, that it should be considered um, as uh, these models are being developed. Um, and then finally, in implementation, I think measuring these tools and how to measure them um, is, um, is going to be an important um, uh, issue that gets a lot more discussion um, going forward. Okay, so let me take uh, just a, uh, a minute or two and talk about um, some of the AI governance work at UC. So, uh, so this is happening both, um, I think, at the system-wide level and also um, at the level of uh, the health locations. And I'll talk about both. And both of those efforts are actually intertwined. Um, because I think with all of the frameworks coming out, one of the things that people really want to do and I think is really important is to, is to um, have efforts align. Um, and I see this both like kind of on the national level and on the state level, but also within UC, to have, um, to reduce you know, redundancy, essentially, and have there be kind of an ability to focus on some of the really important questions that need to be, that need to be answered. So at the UC level, there is a, a system-wide AI council, and this comes out of a report uh, that came out at the end of 2021. And this report actually was, um, I think, a little bit ahead of its time, but it came out of a um, presidential system-wide task force um, about the responsible deployment of AI across UC operations in several domains, of which health was one. The other domains of human resources, the student experience, and policing. And out of that report came actually higher education's first set of AI, of responsible AI um, principles, um, and very initial recommendations about how to operationalize them. Um, also out of that report um, came a system-wide council that is still, um, that is still working uh, today um, and is focused on taking the recommendations in that report and also the evolving landscape of AI and operationalizing some of the recommendations. So as what I would think of as sort of a subgroup of the UC AI Council, there is a health AI governance forum um, that I convene of folks from across the health locations that really um, look to some of the particular opportunities but also challenges that are involved with deploying AI in healthcare. Um, surface difficult use cases, help cut through some of the noise, um, and potentially develop guidance that will be helpful, all of which um, is being done kind of in alignment uh, with the UC um, AI Council. And so I'll turn now to a couple of takeaways for developing AI governance. And I think, you know, this is a very quickly evolving space. But I would say that it is important to address risk over the AI life cycle. I think it is not so much that you can't get to stage two if you haven't done stage one. I think the process should be agile. But I think it is important to think about the different stages of the life cycle in determining um, whether or not um, a model is one that you might want to uh, deploy. I think it's going to require a multidisciplinary approach. And this is something that we talked about a little bit um, in, our, in our discussion um, earlier today. But I think that here you really need more than ever um, to have um, in the room with the policymakers bioinformaticists data scientists, clinicians, um, bioethicists, um, and a number of other stakeholders, including, of course, legal, compliance, um, IT folks. Um, it's, it's going to require um, input from all of these stakeholders um, and the ability to, uh, to, to kind of talk to each other and get out of silos to be able to make some of these determinations going forward. I think generative AI 
amplifies existing risk and also presents uh, new risks. And so I think uh, this is something that needs to be um, kind of grappled with um, on, its, on its own. I think there is um, very much, uh, uh, to a point that Ida raised in her talk, a black box nature of how a lot of these large language models work um, and the data upon which they are trained and whether or not that means that, that responses that come out um, can be replicated. And so all of those things, um, I think, um, are issues that are, um, we're really going to have to kind of work on moving forward. To a point I alluded to earlier, um, it's important to keep a pace with developing laws and regulations. Um, and because of that, uh, and this is a point that, that I, I made earlier, developing AI governance is going to be an ongoing process. So, um, uh, so for those of you in the room, we are, we are I think, um, at the beginning of this, um, not, not the end. Okay, and so finally, uh, I, here are some, uh, um, some reading of the tea leaves um, from me about what might be happening um, on the legislative front um, and also what might be happening within organizations. Uh, and so I don't think I gave a disclaimer at the beginning um, that these views are only my own and don't represent the views of, of the University of California, but here I will, here I will sort of definitely um, uh, say that. These are, these are only my own views, but putting on a little bit um, my former hat as, a, as an FTC person. Here, is, here are a few things that I think will happen. Um, you know, one, I think we are, of course, um, because this was in the executive order, likely to see um, additional agency action as they carry out um, the directives set forth in that executive order. Um, I do not personally uh, think it is likely we will see comprehensive federal AI legislation um, in in the near future. Those things are um, those things are big uh, are are big lifts, um, and it's possible that the stars will align. But um, but I think that that uh, is challenging. That said, I think there are existing pockets of expertise across the federal government. Um, the FTC is is one example, um, and those. Uh, agencies will take their existing authority and they will, um, uh, you know, move into the spaces that authority allows. Um, so, for example, on the FTC front, I, they have had a number of enforcement cases against organizations, um, uh, and this is across uh, industries, so not healthcare focused, um, but that are focused on, on AI. Um, and so, to take one example, at the end of last year, they brought in enforcement action against um, Rite Aid for the use of AI-enabled um, facial recognition um, technology in surveillance. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, that was um, something of note, and I'll say that Commissioner um, Bedoya, who um, uh, issued a statement when that case came out, made some strong statements. Um, I, don't, I don't want to miss represent him, so I'm going to look at my notes here. But so he said a couple of things. He said, you know, for example, the FTC is not afraid to ban the use of a particular AI technology for a number of years or to order the deletion of biometric information collected through it. The FTC will not necessarily accept the use of biometric surveillance in commercial settings. There is a powerful policy argument that there are some decisions that should not be automated at all. And the decision extends beyond smart surveillance into the use of any technology to automate important decisions about people's lives, including decisions that could cause them substantial injury. So I think we're likely to see um, additional enforcement from the FTC in this area as its authority allows. On the competition front, the FTC has also um, been active. And just, I think, this past month, it issued orders to uh, five large technology companies, requiring them to provide information regarding recent investments and partnerships involving generative AI and major cloud services providers to understand the impact of those investments and the potential impact on the marketplace. Um, I think, okay, so that's, that's a little bit um, uh, um, on the federal stage. On the state stage, I think 
uh, we're likely to see some uh, some legislative action, in my view. Um, California is a very um, active state when it comes to uh, issues of privacy. Um, and I think uh, last year, um, the California Privacy Protection Agency released draft automated decision-making technology um, regulations. Um, and so those are um, those are uh, for comment and will be um, potentially coming down the pike. I think for organizations, we are likely to see more organizations um, hire chief um, AI officers to think through both governance and also how to deploy at scale these technologies. Um, and then I will finally um, uh, leave you with this. So I think, I think the cat is out of the bag. I think AI will become part of our future lives. Um, I think it is um, an exciting time and I think it is worth doing, uh, doing the work to have rigorous um, AI governance because I think uh, uh, it will impact kind of all of us. So, um, so I encourage everyone here um, in the room and who is listening to, um, to get involved. Mm -hmm.